So looking here at a humerus, we're looking at an anterior view of a right humerus. We can see that we have a proximal end up here that's obvious because we have the head of the humerus here. So the head of the humerus is about a third of a sphere. It looks like someone's got some ice cream and just plonked a scoop of ice cream down there. It's nice and smooth. Now that has to be pointing medially. So that has to be on the medial aspect so you know that the scapula is going to be right here where that articulates. Now on the anterior surface of the proximal end we have a lesser tubercle here. If I just turn so we can see it in profile, there's the lesser tubercle. And on the lateral surface, seen from a lateral point of view now, we have a greater tubercle here. So that tells us we've got medial, anterior and lateral. So that tells us we must have an anterior view here of a right humerus. Then around the head, we have what's called the anatomical neck. And it's just this little ridge that runs right around the smooth articular surface of the head of the humerus. So that's the anatomical neck. It's a ridge. Yep. It lo looks like a little line of bone there. So that's an anatomical neck. Now if, it's, if the humerus has an anatomical neck, what does that suggest to you? That there's probably another, another neck. Yeah, there's a surgical neck as well. So a lot of bones just have a head and a neck. This one has two necks though. So the surgical neck is just here. And it's where we move from having the tubercles in the head and quite a lot of uh, cancellous bone there, quite a lot of bone tissue. And then the, the, we're not quite into the shaft yet, but we're in that point where it's tapering from the head and the tubercles down to the shaft. And so it gets a bit thinner, but it's still mostly cancellous or spongy bone. It's not a lot of cortical or compact bone here. So it's a weak spot. That's a spot where fractures can fairly easily occur on the humerus. And so that's called the surgical neck. Now then if we move down the shaft and we need to have a look from a lateral or at a lateral point of view now, we can see there's a roughened patch here just near my hand where it looks like something might be attaching. That's the deltoid tuberosity. And that, of course, is the distal attachment of the deltoid muscle. Now then, if we move down towards the distal end, and again, we've got an anterior point of view here, immediately when you look at the distal end, you can spot this great big lump of bone here. That's the medial epicondyle. Now that is always going to be, unless it's broken, always going to be much more prominent than the lateral epicondyle. Now an epicondyle, epi means upon, so this is a bit of bone that's upon a condyle and it sticks out to the side. So medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. The condyles are here and they, they have particular names though. They're not just called medial lateral condyles. That would be too easy. So this one here is the trochlea and that's kind of hourglass or pulley shaped. If you imagine a rope running through here, you can see how it kind of runs through that groove in the middle like a rope would run through a pulley. So that's the trochlea. That means pulley or pulley shape. And then this is the capitulum, which means little head or small head. So that's, we've got the head up the other end, then we've got the small head down here, the capitulum. Now superior to those features, we have a coronoid fossa here, just superior or proximal to the trochlea. And then we have a radial fossa, which is a bit smaller here. It's a bit less of a depression than the coronoid. And that's just proximal or superior to the capitulum. Now then on the posterior aspect, we have this large olecranon fossa. And so those three fossae are named for what fits into them when you're in different positions. So in extension, the olecranon is going to fit into that olecranon fossa. And in flexion, the coronoid process of the ulna fits in the coronoid fossa and the head of the radius in the radial fossa.